This is Josh Mandel with a quick tour of some of the capabilities that GPT-4 and the ChatGPT code interpreter have for making sense of structured interoperable healthcare data. And after we take a look at that, we're gonna zoom out and try to evaluate how important is it to use standards to structure these data in the first place? And what could a future look like where structure was added to free data or free text data on the fly? We're going to start off, though, by taking a fire bundle that was produced by the Cynthia open source tool from MITRE. And I picked this out of the sample data in the Smart Health IT Sandbox. I chose this particular patient because their record includes a diagnosis of hypertension, as well as treatment for that hypertension using a diuretic called hydrochlorothiazide, and also has several blood pressure readings that demonstrate uh, high blood pressure over time. So. What we're going to do is just put this file wholesale into the ChatGPT with code interpreter mode, which they now call advanced data analysis. It's important to say we couldn't just paste this entire JSON file into the context of the model because it's too big. But we can upload the file and allow the model to interact with it through the file system and by writing Python code. So in this case, we're going to upload the file and ask this question. Is my blood pressure getting better since I started on that water pill? Um, we're intentionally using some kind of vague clinical or um, sort of patient-oriented language instead of conventional clinical terms uh, to see how the model can cope. So first thing the model's going to do is say, sure, I see you've uploaded some kind of fire bundle. So we're going to open that in a Python um, code block and take a look. So the model imports the Python JSON libraries. It loads the file into memory. And the model still can't see inside of this file yet. It's just processing it in Python code. But it wants to know more about what's in the file. So what it does is it writes Python code, knowing that this is a fire bundle. So it just automatically is able to extract all the resource types and then prints out a short output, which is just going to be the set of unique resource types that occurs in the file. And this is the first point at which our GPT instance actually gets a glimpse directly into the file contents. Here's where it can see what types of fire resources are in there. And so it's able to use that output and proceed to say, I see what kinds of resource types are in that bundle. Uh, for my purposes, I'm going to care most about medication requests, those are prescriptions, uh, and observations, which are going to be blood pressures, in order to answer this question about the effectiveness of blood pressure meds. And it proceeds to then try to find all of the blood pressure medications that have been prescribed. And it does this by drilling into the medication request resources and looking inside of the medication codable concept text field, which it normalizes into lowercase, and it searches for the phrase water pill. And then it tries to print the start dates associated with uh, any of those medications. And it sees an empty array here, which is the first clue that it has that this phrase water pill probably doesn't occur in the file anywhere. And indeed, the model concludes, it seems there's no direct mention of water pill, but that's okay. I'll broaden the search for potential diuretic medications. And it just uses its own innate knowledge of medication classes and types in order to redo the search, this time matching the text for a specific list of common diuretics, furosemide, hydrochlorothiazide, spironolactone, and so on down the list. Uh, and from each of those, it tries to pull out the drug name and the start date. And now is the first time the model is able to see that there have indeed been prescriptions for uh, some water pills here, which are hydrochlorothiazide. Looks like there were two different doses used, about a year apart. And the model is then able to remember what it was doing. So it successfully extracted the medications and it just plows right on forward to extract data from the observations to find blood pressures. Um, and again, it uses this strategy of matching the phrase blood pressure in the observation codes, lowercase text. And when it finds things that seem to be blood pressures, it drills right into the text of the blood pressure components to try to differentiate systolic from diastolic, and then it just plows right on forward to pull out the effective date from any of those blood pressures, and it sorts them by that field, and it prints them. And this is the first time now that the ChatGPT instance is able to see the actual blood pressure readings, which are printed here, sorted by date. Uh, so the code interpreter, or advanced analytics mode, has successfully extracted all the data it needs to answer this question. It prints them in a nicely formatted bullet list, and it's even able to do some analysis to say it's interesting that the latest readings from 2018 and 19, after the start of hydrochlorothiazide, show a significant increase in blood pressure. And that's counterintuitive. 
and the patient might want to consult with their healthcare professional uh, to see if adjustments to the treatment plan are needed. Uh, so from my perspective, this is just an incredible tour de force. The model is able to just plow through the data analysis, overcoming obstacles, uh, rerouting uh, the analysis plan in real time, all based on this structured fire data that it understands quite well and is able to sort and, and parse and navigate through. Um, so really pretty incredible. And I think this is gonna change the way that a lot of clinical questions get asked and answered. Uh, it's almost like uh, having a data analyst um, right there, ready to answer things at your beck and call. But for me, this also sparks some interesting lines of follow-on questions. Uh, so one is the fact that this uh, analysis really relied very heavily on the free text data inside of the codes in the resources suggests that uh, we might be able to do pretty well even without a standard like FHIR. So even if the source systems weren't able to map all of their data perfectly into interoperability standards. So I wanted to at least explore what that would look like. And I'll say this is a pretty early exploration. The things I'm showing you are sort of rough, a little overcomplicated. Uh, they don't all fit together perfectly. I'm gonna cherry pick examples a little bit. So I'll share all the prompts that I'm using for this um, so you can try it out afterwards. But just to give you kind of a flavor of what the world could look like uh, in a future state where the AIs are able to talk to each other about patient records without having to uh, rely on pre-formatted, pre-standardized data. So to explore this, I took the Fire bundle that came from Cynthia and I wrote a very quick script to turn each resource in this bundle into a free text English language description uh, of, of its content. And I intentionally was pretty vague uh, in terms of describing this task, and I ran it in a zero-shot fashion using ChatGPT, or, or rather using GPT 3.5 Turbo. Um, so every model call was independent, so we called it hundreds of times, to generate this kind of what I'm gonna call a simple health text file where each fire resource winds up just being one line in this file. And I included the fire resource IDs just so I could trace back to, to the source for each one if I wanted to later. Um, but morally speaking, uh, these lines that say entry can be ignored. Uh, all the actual content is in these lines here. So there's data about insurance claims. There's data about clinical encounters. There's data um, about the patient demographics, uh, information about lab observations, and if we search through this for some of the data we saw before, we can see there's information about hydrochlorothiazide uh, prescriptions. There's information uh, across two different resources that take quite a different format, because again, the model was called in kind of a zero shot fashion. So imagine that the EHR kind of looks like this, a whole bunch of lines of English text that together tell the story of the patient's clinical history. Um, what could a data analysis pipeline uh, look like? So I'm gonna take this same key question from our session with the advanced data analysis tool. And I'm gonna paste this into a session now in the OpenAI playground, where I have given the model some instructions about essentially how to create a data schema on the fly, a data schema that's tailored, hyper-targeted to a specific question being asked. So there's some generic instructions that I've written here, kind of helping GPT-4 do this task. But now I'm gonna paste in this key question, uh, which is really just, is my blood pressure getting better since I started that water pill? And I'm gonna ask GPT-4 to come up with an analysis plan and a data schema to be able to answer this question. Um, and I asked for the output in this TypeScript format, and here's what I got. I got a TypeScript type definition that says things like, um, we're gonna have an EHR chunk, that's our top level interface, which I kind of prescribed, and then everything else is up to GPT-4 to model. And so it decided to have an array of blood pressure readings and an array of diuretic medications, because that's the minimum data needed to answer this question. And then blood pressure readings are just a date, systolic, diastolic, and diuretic meds are just a name, uh, start time, and then some information about the current status. Now I'm gonna run a couple more prompts just to make our analysis job uh, a little bit streamlined. So one is asking the model to output some data filters so that we can take our text file 
and narrow it down to just a set of lines that are relevant. And so I've asked it to just use the key question uh, in order to create a grep command, which uh, I'll just run manually to filter the records down to pull out just the data we want. Um, and I asked it to do that in a kind of sensitive way so that we would hopefully find all the data we wanted. And so in this case, it's going to grep that text file for things like blood pressure, systolic, diastolic, diuretic, hydrochlorothiazide, um, and so on. And if I take this grep command, I'm going to run that grep command and save the result locally on my clipboard um, so that I can ask a subsequent copy of this model to do the data abstraction based on that input. So I'm just going to paste that whole chunk of text right in. And I'm also going to copy in the data schema that was created so that the abstraction tool knows how to format the output. So I'll let this run now. And this is going to perform a data abstraction according to this very narrow data model that was created just to answer this particular clinical question. Uh, and I'll pause and, and let the model proceed and come back when it's done. OK, so we're just finishing up here. Uh, the, GPT-4 instance was able to extract a whole series of blood pressure readings into this standardized format, as it were, and it was able to find two diuretic medications. Um, and so what I got here is an EHR chunk. And if the health record was big enough, I might have to do this processing in several chunks and merge all of them. But the design of this chunk data model is that everything is an array, so we can merge chunks just by concatenating these arrays. Okay, so I'm going to take this chunk and I'm going to put it in a JSON file. And that's going to allow us to move on and see how the code interpreter does with data in this format um, using this schema that we defined on the fly. Um, in order to do that, I want to provide some specific instructions to the code interpreter. I don't want to have to write those instructions by hand. So I'm once again just going to ask GPT to create that prompt for me. In this case, I'm going to say, provide instructions for a helpful informatics assistant with access to this full EHR JSON structure uh, with all the merged chunks. Assume they have no context and tell them everything they'll need in order to answer the key question. And so now we're getting a prompt that we can use with the code interpreter. The prompt says, hey there, the key question I'm trying to answer is, is my blood pressure getting better since I started on that water pill? So here's what you need to do. Start looking at the, at the diuretic meds, um, look at when they were started, move on to the blood pressures, uh, analyze these to see if there's a trend. If anything doesn't match, don't worry. You can manually inspect the data using console.log to print out a smaller manageable subset. Remember, you're looking for a trend of decreasing blood pressures over time. Good luck. So I'm going to take this prompt now, and I'm going to put it into a new instance of the chat GPT with code interpreter. Um, and then the other thing I need to give it is the actual data schema. Uh, just exactly the same as the TypeScript scheme that we've uh, auto-generated and used in other spots. And then finally, I'm going to upload this full EHR file um, that has the results of our data abstraction task. And we'll cross our fingers and put all these things together and see how the code interpreter does with this mission. Um, it's happy to get started. Let's look at full EHR.json, start by inspecting its contents. And so we can see internally what it's doing here is just going to open that file in Python. It's going to extract and print out that data subset, and it's going to limit it to just the first five blood pressures to get started, uh, because it probably wants to avoid printing out too much information. It doesn't want to overflow its context. Uh, it sees we've got a list of blood pressures, and we printed the first few. And it sees there's two diuretic meds, uh, one of which was discontinued. And given all this information, we can identify the start dates, filter the blood pressures, and so on. So here's what it's going to do. It's going to extract some information about the active meds. It's going to see there was one that was started in 2019. It's going to filter the blood pressure readings to only include the ones from after this date. Um, it's going to take this filtered list. It got none. And it says, without any post-medication readings, we can't determine the trend in blood pressures since the start of the water pill. Do you want to proceed with any other analysis or provide any additional data? Uh, so that's interesting. The very last change in meds happened after the blood pressures went up. I'll just say, what about earlier, the very first dose? Let's 
see if it's able to cope uh, with that on the fly. So this time around, it's going to find the earliest date. Understands that was 2018. And it says we only have one reading after starting that medication, so it's challenging to determine a trend. Ideally, we'd want multiple readings. So I just paused to do a little bit of lab debugging, and really interestingly, uh, this was not what I expected, but the model got it right. Uh, the source data here shows something kind of strange. The very first time, the earliest time, that hydrochlorothiazide is mentioned in the source data, in the fire data, it's mentioned to say that this drug was stopped on 2018, January 23rd. Now, there's no uh, documentation of it ever having been started prior to that date, uh, so it's a little bit odd, but actually the interpretation that the code interpreter came up with here is, is spot on. The original analysis that we ran in an automated way on the fire bundle, uh, if we look at the way that it extracted this information about water pills and then diuretics, it looked for these uh, effective dates on any drugs that mentioned these diuretic names. And it found this date of January 23rd, but it failed to look at the fact that the drug was stopped on that date. The status was stopped. Now, let's review what that means in FHIR. Uh, let's go to R4, because this is the version of Cynthia that we're using. Uh, and we're going to look at these status codes. So the status here, status of stopped. Let's just make sure we understand exactly what's intended by that. Stopped means that any actions implied by the prescription are to be permanently halted uh, before all the administrations occurred. So there is this notion that this drug was explicitly stopped, even though we don't have any information about when it was started. Uh, so I'll say overall this has been pretty impressive. Um, by taking this approach where the model can create its own structure on the fly, abstract the raw data into that structure, just going through English as a lingua franca, uh, and then perform the analysis, we're able to get to uh, kind of the right answer that actually after the hydrochlorothiazide was started, uh, there are no additional blood pressure readings. Um, and, you know, frankly, it's something I had missed when I was looking through the fire data by hand, and that the code interpreter missed when it was working through that fire bundle um, without running any status checks along the way. Uh, so for me, this has been a pretty interesting deep dive. Uh, I'm really bullish on this concept that over time, we might be able to see very strong levels of clinical data interoperability, even without predefined standards. Uh, I think standards will still have a very clear and important role in improving uh, the performance of these systems. Obviously, we can't take a full EHR and run it through state-of-the-art uh, models every time we want to answer any clinical question. So having these kinds of predefined intermediate artifacts still matters a lot. But at least from the perspective of what you can get done in a totally automated fashion, uh, I think we're going to start to find that this sort of data abstraction can be done in a late binding way and that different users might pick their own intermediate data formats to work with based on their own preferences or based on the kind of work that they want to do. Uh, so that's kind of a, a big idea for me, something I'm going to be noodling on when I think about kind of where work in the HL7 and FHIR community is going and where the real value proposition is. I think more and more I'll be focused or continue to focus on data access rules, uh, and it might be less and less important to work out all of the details about the formats in which data are shared. Uh, there is a corollary to this, though, uh, something we struggle with very often in the standards world. We define these standards saying how we want data to be shaped on the way out of a clinical system, but we often have very little control or impact on the way that data are first captured. Um, and so there's also an important lesson here. If we could focus on clinical standards that shape how documentation is written in the first place, shape the questions that are asked or the data that are um, 
recorded in the first place, that might actually have more of an impact in improving quality and consistency of care than just trying to shape the data on the way out of the system. You can't uh, export in a standard way what you didn't collect in the first place. And maybe over time, the most important thing is going to be for clinical and professional societies to establish standards or norms about the data that are captured. And they don't have to be super specific around syntax, but they can focus really on the semantics of the information that's needed uh, to make a given diagnosis uh, or to go down a certain decision tree. Right, so that's it for today. Hopefully this has been uh, thought-provoking for you, as it has been for me, and we will follow up with some of these ideas down the line.